folks, let's get started. Sorry for the slight delay. I was getting a time two ready. Oh, oh, oh. The more groaning is what the next assignment will be. Uh, so, now we're getting closer to um, more security type exercises. So, these are each basically challenges that you have to break. So, uh, two weeks. The first part, this is a little warm up. This part should not be very difficult. Um, the idea is there is a website called Over the Wire. They have a bunch of really cool war games. Uh, if you want to get really into binary exploitation, this is a great way to do that. You're going to be doing levels 0 through 20 on here. This is the absolute beginner one. <laughs> Nothing fancy here. This is just getting you used to accessing a Linux server over SSH and doing with the command line and those kind of stuff. This is not meant to be super difficult, but you may need to, depending on your experience level, learn something to do this. Uh, and so to track you with this, we are going to use a leech all which is a site that keeps track of how people are doing across all different kinds of challenges. So what we're going to do in the next day, we're going to email each of you individually with a, basically a random user ID. So you'll sign up to this website with this user ID. And then you will uh, set up your Over the Wire account so that when you break a level on Over the Wire, it will post onto your WeChall account, and that way we can check and make sure that you're actually breaking all the levels. Um, and that's how we'll be grading you and following your progress. So for this assignment, um, just need to submit a readme file with the description of how you broke each level. And we'll be pulling, at the deadline we'll pull down where everybody was and how many levels they broke, and that will be your score for that part. Uh, one important thing to note on this section, and I call it out here, these war games are, have been public for a long time, so if you search hard, it's not hard to find the solutions and walkthroughs to these levels, but that's not really the point. The point is, you know, if you can't do these easy ones, the next homework assignment is going to be insanely difficult for you. So you should spend time learning this stuff, getting it in now, that way the next time it's going to be a lot easier. Questions on this? The second one is you'll be pen testing a new awesome startup. Uh, it does not look fancy. I wonder. I don't think I can. Wait, maybe I can. What do you think the odds are that I remember the IP address? 1090.128.7. Analyzing the assembly language code. 
So you'll need to know x86, or you'll need to learn it. You will use file, object, readout, whatever tools you need to use uh, to do this to understand how this program is working and to extract the password from this program. Any questions on that? Yes? All you need is the password. Uh, you need the password. Any files you may have used to crack the password, just in case there's anything you use. Uh, similarly, in part two, if there's any files you use to try to, I don't know, whatever you're, whatever you're using, just submit uh, everything. Uh, and readme. So yeah, these ones are more breaking things rather than programming stuff. So Maybe. will you be like submitting like a password, like checking back, like how are we verifying that? So like, an automatic test case that says, oh, you've got the right password. Yes, the server, submitted server will tell you that you were correct. And you got like 17 chances or unlimited? I think it's unlimited, but I think it's capped at like 100 of those. Okay. Don't, don't try to guess it by guessing who the submit is. What are some good resources to learn about like x86? The internet. Okay. <laughs> yes. Use your Google power, you will find stuff out there. There's a good wiki book on x86 assembly. There's good, you know, all kinds of good stuff. Okay. The other thing is, you know, you shouldn't just read a whole book on x86, right? Right. Uh, you want to accomplish a certain task, so I am always task focused on things that I need to learn, so go through there, see what instructions are happening, and figure out those things so you can start piecing together what's happening. Okay. Yeah. Do you have stats from the last assignment? Uh, I do not yet. We're going through and grading uh, the assignments to see if there's any, anybody used any libraries or anything they're not supposed to use. So we'll be adjusting scores, so hopefully not too much. It was pretty good though, I think, overall, from my brief view. Yeah. What are the secret test cases for the last one? I can't tell you that. <laughs> Test cases that only have to do with the specification, I promise. You can come see me in office hours and we can talk about it. I'm happy to do that, but I'm not going to broadcast everything. I'm going to keep some stuff secret.
to transfer the control flow of the program, right? We talked about uh, pro, you know, assembly code and code we write doesn't usually just start at the top, start executing until it gets to the bottom, right? We want to jump around and have branches, so we have jump instructions, which is also an unconditional jump, right? So this is always jump here. A call instruction calls another function. What's the difference between a call and a jump? <coughs>
type of indoor plant. Yes, but it's a fixed. Hmm. I think it would depend on the compiler. I'm not sure how how normal the compiler is. One way to do it would be essentially have you could have an array, and then you can figure out based on the comparison which place to jump to based on your table that you made. Um, yeah, I think they have some jump tables, or you could just translate the switch statement into an if else statement. This, uh, we have to provide a value to the register and then they have to jump, right? Because we don't, we can't, we can't write, in a, uh, can we write in a thing once it's done? So if the, it's just like any other branch statement, right? You're branching based on the condition of one variable. So you test that variable and you say, okay, if it's 10 or if it's 1, then execute this branch. Otherwise, jump over it. And then check if it's 20, execute this other branch or jump over it. That would be if it translates to a switch statement. Uh, a table, like an if-else. Cool. Uh, input, output, so there's ways to do input and output to peripherals. Uh, I think this will almost never happen, so I'm going to ignore that for now. Uh, one important instruction is the not instruction. So what does this do? Nothing. Nothing. Why does it exist? Why would you waste your creating an instruction set architecture? You have a limited number of instructions you can possibly have. Why would you waste instructions on something that does nothing? Timing, sleep. If you're waiting for input. If we're waiting for input. Yeah, there may be times, so there's a lot of reasons, right? There may be times where maybe we just want to loop and do nothing. And still we could maybe like have a check and then a jump back to that check and that would essentially be a no op. Or we could uh, add zero to a register, right? That could also be a no op. Um, in general, if, to harken back a long time to when you learned about pipelining and CPU architectures, there would be some architectures where the CPU would have to manually put no ops in between instructions so that that way they were not executed as part of the pipeline. Um, so that would be another reason why. I don't know specifically why x86 has it, but it's there, uh, and it's, it will be important. Okay, so system call. So we talked about system call. So what's a system call? Executes in the terminal? Call no. Kernel. Kernel, yes. So it's a call from a user space program into kernel functionality. And this allows basically the kernel to mediate access or uh, do, so when you're opening a file, that's a system call that happens into the kernel, and the kernel's the one that decides, hey, do you actually get to open this file or not, right? And that's where all those file permission checks and everything that's important happens. So most of the time when you're coding, a C program, you will not write a C program that calls system calls directly. Uh, oftentimes, this is happening in the library. So for instance, on Linux, there's system calls for read and write. And if you read from file descriptor zero, is usually standard input. And if you write to standard uh, file descriptor one, that's standard out. And if you write to file descriptor two, that's standard error. So this is, and this is a system call in between you to the kernel to actually write output of your program. Now, what do you normally use to write output of your program in C? Printf. Printf. So what is printf doing? Yeah, so it's giving you a lot more functionality on top of just, hey, output this many bytes. So printf, so I think, believe the write system command, the write system call is the file descriptor, the buffer, and the number of bytes you want to send, right? So, but printf, you don't have to send that. You just pass it a string, and it will try to print it out. Or you can get really fancy and have a fancy printf string with a lot of different format arguments and pass a ton of arguments to uh, the function. So, the key idea is the kernel provides this kind of basics functionality, and the libraries are, are providing other functionality on top of that. So, oftentimes, 
You don't actually need to call system calls directly, but they are going to be incredibly important when we want to start writing shell code because we want to not use the system library, we want to call into the kernel directly. So, the way you set up is an interrupt of hex 80 on uh, Linux x86. So this is how you signal to the kernel, hey, I want to make a system call. And there's a various protocol that we have to get into of how to actually do this. Um, and because you're going to put in the EAX register the system call number that you're trying to call. So we can have a super simple hello world assembly program. We can have in the dot string section, or we can have in the data section, a string hello world that has the label HW. We can then in our text section, so now we have code. We are saying that we want main to be a globally accessible symbol so that everyone else can see this main function. Then in here, we can do things like move four into EAX, move one into EDX, move, I don't know what this is doing. Yeah, so this is gonna move the address of this string, hello HW, into the register ECX. And then we're gonna move 12 into EDX. So what's the, how many bytes is this string, hello world? A bunch. A bunch, <laughs> not very specific. It should be 12. Yeah, with the new line 12. And then we call it int 80. So from here, you can kind of tease apart the calling convention, right? Because we're calling into the kernel, we're not calling a regular function, right? So we're not going to have a call instruction. What we have is we move the number. So um, system call number four is right. And you can look this up. There's a header file that defines all these symbols and specifies exactly what the system call numbers are. <coughs> 4 into EAX, 1 into EBX, that would be the file descriptor we want to write out to. So 1 is standard out, so this string will be printed on the standard output stream of our program. The ECX is the second parameter, so this is the buffer that we want to print out from. And EDX is the third parameter, and it specifies uh, how many bytes we want to print out. So we'll do all this, and then just like a call instruction, right? You can think of this really as a function call into the kernel. So we call into the kernel, the kernel's gonna do stuff, and then it will return. And when it returns, we're gonna move it zero into EAX and then return. So the zero into EAX, this is setting up the return value of main. So we haven't gotten into it yet, but this is how function return values in x86 is by putting a value into the EAX register. Questions on assembly? It's actually kind of fun to do. I mean, you'll do it a little bit more when you're writing shell code, but it's kind of fun to like get down really closely to the CPU and just like, kind of mess with instructions. Right? Don't have to worry about variables. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about very briefly. Well, okay, so we don't call system calls directly in our code, right? We're using libraries. But how actually do those shared libraries work? So what are the two types of ways to use a library? So static, what's static linking? Yeah. Yes, compiled into the executable itself, where dynamically linking does what? Points to What was that? Runtime, yeah, so it loads the, the library at runtime. So how could you actually do that? Right, so think about it. You're, how do you compile code that's gonna call other code at runtime? Yeah. Use a linker. What does that mean, what does a linker do? You have all your function calls uh, point to a table and then uh, update that table once you want to uh, redirect it towards the function. Classic computer science response, right? 
saying, hey, we don't know where we're going to go, where we're going to call, right? So let's add a level of indirection, and then we can change that, those indirections, right? Because one option would be the very naive and super straightforward way is, well, just put a whatever, some placeholder in for every call. If you're going to call, just say call printf. I don't know, you made all caps, whatever. Call some printf function, and every place that you call printf, before the program executes, it goes through, and let's say it replaces that foo, uh, printf with the actual address of the printf library when it loads up. Right? That has a lot of problems uh, because you may not know exactly where it is, and then you have to calculate. A lot of times, calls are can be uh, offset. Anyways, so there can be a lot of problems there. And you have to fix every single place where it's called, right? Because you have all these calls to the printf function. So the main way around this is indirection. Well, instead of calling into the function directly, what you do is you get the value in some table. And so you know printf will always be at this fixed offset. Get the value inside that table and jump to that value. So it's essentially an indirect jump into printf. And so this way, all the linker has to do is when it loads up, it says, OK, let's find the libc library. Great. Loaded it in memory. Great. OK, now I have to put the addresses of all these functions that are used in the correct places in this table. And bang, everything in the program will work. So this is exactly what happens. So this is what the PLT and the GOT do. Um, so the PLT contains all these essentially little trampolines that fetch the entry from the GOT, so there's like multiple levels of indirection, fetch the actual entry from the global offset table, and jump to it. So the idea is when we call the function, we'll call some function in the PLT, and that little bit of code will get the address from the global offset table and jump to that address. So one cool thing to do is uh, would be to look at this in the, what you have to do for part three. So looking at that binary, you can see through and kind of look and see actually how this functionality looks like in the code. Um, yes, so, and the way to get around this, the cool part is, well, why load a library that's never called? Right? You may have a complicated program, it may have lots of libraries. So the idea is in the PLT, the first entries link to uh, point to an entry that basically says, hey, load this library. This is what was called. And then once it's loaded, now the GOT entries work. And now all the subsequent calls will have that library loaded. Um, a key thing here is for this to function, should the program ever be able to change the, the, uh, the procedure linking table, the PLT? No, we shouldn't, it shouldn't ever change, right? This is, these are always little things that say, hey, grab something from the global offset table and jump to it. Now, what about the global offset table? If you update your standard C library, the functions are different locations. Hey, fundamentally, this is a table that at runtime has to be, we have to write the addresses of all the library functions that we're using in our code. So fundamentally, this table must be writable. And that's actually a very important fact that's going to come up when we talk about uh, exploiting uh, all kinds of vulnerabilities. Format sharing vulnerabilities are one of the big ones. Uh, so this fact that we can write to the global offset table is incredibly important. OK. So. What's happening? So just like we kind of talked about at the end of networking, one uh, good way to check yourself is to think about everything that happens when you put google.com into the address bar of your browser and hit enter. What are the exact things that happen? Another interesting thing is thinking about what happens when you're on a bash prompt and you type in ls and hit enter. Right? What are the exact steps that happen in order for that program to be executed. So what does Bash do? Is Bash anything special? Separate it out. Is Bash 
catch anything special? No, not really. No. Kind of. I just didn't even know when I first answered, asked that question. You guys didn't even have time to think. Um, it is a shell, right? So there are certain programs that are designated as shells, right? So the idea is it's not anything really special about the program, it's special about what it does, right? What it does is accept input from you and executes programs based on that. So it's not anything super special. So how does Bash work at a high level? What happens when you type in an LS and hit enter? The first thing it has to do is it first has to ask which, what LS are you talking about? Which exact program, right? You could have, are you talking about the LS program that's in the current directory? The one that's in slash bin, the one that's in slash user slash bin, right? There could be the one that's in slash s bin, right? There could be many different, um, many different LS programs. And so it needs to know exactly which one do you mean. So there's actually a procedure that we'll see that it figures out exactly what you mean. So then let's get rid of that and say, what happens when I just type in slash bin slash ls? Yes? What can it do? Yes, this is all it does. The super, bash is incredibly stupid. All it does is figures out which program you want to execute. It forks, what does fork do? Creates a new process. Creates a new process that's exactly the same as the old process. And then, well, it's exactly the same except for what difference? The return value of fork is different, so you can know which one is the child and which one is the parent. So the parent's usually going to remain as bash, and the child is then going to call exec with the command you pass in, slash bin slash ls. And that, what does exec do? Executes a program? Yeah, does all this. So really, exec is a wrapper around the exec de system call. And so eventually exec will call exec ve, and then the operating system will say, okay, this process wanted to call this exec, uh, this exec ve, this means it wants to completely change its process from bash into now this slash bin slash sh. So it reads the elf header file, it loads everything up in the proper memory addresses, and it starts executing at the entry point. Um, and, so, and then it starts executing, and then bash is waiting, listening for when its child PID is done executing. And then when it's done executing, it uh, asks you for the prompt about what you want to do next. So this is at a high level what shells do. Uh, if you ever have a chance to write your own shell, highly recommend it. It's a good learning experience. So this is what we're looking at. So how does the operating system take this file, right? That's the important thing to remember. It's just a file on disk, but it turns it into a running process. So it's actually pretty simple, right? We already saw the elf header file format. It parses that header file format, and it copies everything in memory. A very cool thing to do on a Linux system, the slash proc file system is a special file system that has information about what processes are running on your system. So you can cap out slash proc slash whatever PID process ID of the process you're interested in slash maps, and that will show you the memory layout of the process and show you exactly where things are. Um, so, that was no delay. All right, so, so the proc file system is really cool. You can see it has all of the processes, processes that are running on this system. I think, does anybody remember, I think, There's some way to access the current processes. Is it current? So we can access the maps. Can you all read this text? Okay, 
Okay, so we can see that what this is telling us is that, wow, there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, I wonder what process this is. Uh, but we can see interesting stuff in here. So we can see that memory region from 004, 000 to 0048A, if memory is readable, executable, and I don't know what the P means, uh, but you'll notice that it's not writable, so it's only executable memory. And this means that this file slash user slash x86 underscore 64 Linux GNU HUD, HUD service is mapped into that location. And so you can see that for all of these addresses, so you can see everything about where these things are mapped. So what it decides is where to put everything in memory, right? So where to put that and those are executables in memory. Um, sorry, not the executables. The segments that are defined in the ELF header, where should it put them in memory? It may be fixed based on the file itself. Then we may need to do some uh, relocation. So when we get into ASLR, we'll talk about the operating system, if the binary is compiled specially, it can relocate and change where the code segments are so it's not in this fixed place every time. And then the OS sets the instruction pointer specified as the entry point in the ELF header and it starts executing from there. So then what does the address space look like of the program? So on a normal x86, process, and this does, I found this does vary if you're on 64-bit versus 32-bit. So if you're running a 32-bit application on a 64-bit system, the memory layout will look slightly different. But usually, and for assignment three, you'll be on just a 32-bit system. So usually the first gigabyte of memory is reserved by the kernel. So you'll never see any addresses with all Fs because those are not for your program, those are specified for the kernel. Then your program usually starts with 
everything after one gigabyte. So the DF addresses all the way down to the zero addresses are what's mapped for your program. If you're running it on a 64-bit operating system, I've seen the you get basically everything. So all your addresses start with all the Fs. I don't know why I have my suspicions. But. So what is so when your program executes, what does it use as input? So how how when you write, let's say, a program, how do you get access to the command arguments that are passed? Yes? Is it on the stack? I remember. So in C, how do you access the command line arguments? Arg V. Right, the second argument to main. So the first one is an integer, arg c, that tells you how many arguments are in the argv vector. And then you have a character pointer pointer, which is an array of a null term, I think it's a null terminated array of pointers to the arguments, each of the arguments. Right? And just like any C function, these arguments are on the stack above your program. Right? But even before that, so you think about what the stack looks like. So right above you is going to be arg c, which is the integer, right? So that's just four bytes. And then above that is going to be an, a pointer to what? So what is arg b? A pointer to a pointer. Yeah, so the, the important thing to remember, so I actually want to diagram this. I think it's going to be important. Um, and this is something that I found really useful when the kernel, the very first thing that it does is creates first the environment and argument section. So if you look at top of memory to bottom of memory, Right? This is how we're going to always draw it so the stack will grow down. On the very start of the stack is all of these strings of the environment and the strings of argv. This is really important to understand exactly when you give input to the program. When you change parameters of a program, how does that change the memory layout of the program? So we have the strings, then we have the pointers. Right? We have to have those tables. Uh, this is a pointer to this first string up here, this is a pointer to this next string up here. We have arg c, oh sorry. So we have all the arg, well, this actually is missing a step. There should be pointers up to the actual data for each of these things. Then we have arg c, then we have our stack. And so the stack is, as we'll see, is going to grow depending on how the program executes. All the function calls will push new information onto the stack, so the stack will keep track of the current function calls so that we can go backwards. Uh, it's also used for any temporary storage that a function might need. Yes? Is the stack used for child processes? So, when you fork a process, so that's how you get a child, when you fork a process, the forked process has exactly the same memory layout and everything that your parent process has. So it's all shared? It's not shared. If you write to the child, you won't see it in the parent, unless you set up other stuff. Okay. Uh, but it's different. It's it's separate, but it's it's the same. Like the data is actually the same. So this is part of the problem. One of the, they have a lot of classic vulnerabilities is you have a forking web server that would fork, and then the child would be able to read some secret password that was input from the parent. Right, because it shares the process space, so it can read it, but once it writes it, it gets its own copy, essentially. Yes? Uh, how much memory does it get? Is that? Uh, that's a good question. I think it varies, but it is a fixed <coughs> stack layout. It's not an infinite. At some point, you'll stop, and we'll see why, because after this, our, so the stack has a fixed endpoint, 
And I believe you should be able to see, actually this is a good question. I think you should be able to see in the else section, there's a stack section, and so you should be able to see from there the size that's allocated to the stack. Is, is there like a termination character like zero or something? Uh, the termination character is the fact that the next byte after that is not mapped to your program. So when your program tries to access that, the kernel will give you a second page of call. Yeah. Isn't it possible to specify the stack size? Probably, yes. I've never had to change it or mess with it, but I'm sure you can. Yes? Uh, what do you exactly mean by the space it might need for the arguments, or uh, what exactly? Oh, for the, for the stack <coughs> specifically. So depending on the argument, that will change the top part. And depending on your RMB parameters, that will change the next part. And then you have that kind of pink section in there is space that your program can use as it's executing. So it can use that whole space all the way down to the end of that arrow, and then it can't use anymore. So the stack will grow down and will, will, will grow down when it's being used, and when it's being free, it will move back up. So a well-written program should not exceed the stack. So if you went and had a recursive, infinitely recursive call, you'll keep allocating them around the stack until you try to alloc until you try to write to one of those bytes that are outside that memory segmentation, and so it will throw a second page of call. So is it uh, is it the standard for every program, or is it based on based on? I believe you should be able to change it based on compiler options, but I don't know. So below there we have space for any shared libraries. So any libraries that we're going to need will be loaded there. Then we have the heap. So what's the heap? Every time we call malloc, we get memory at, given to our program. Uh, technically, malloc is a libc construct. So the kernel has no idea about malloc and free. Uh, the kernel uses a, or the, there is a system call called sbrk, S -B -R -K, which allows a program to increase the size of its heap. And so that's how it gets more memory from the kernel. And I think you can also decrease that as well. So we have our heap, and the heap grows up, right? And so similarly, it has a fixed location where you cannot get any more. Things change and become a lot easier when you have 64 address spaces, address space, right? Because then these things are very far apart, right? Cool. Uh, you then have uh, after the heap, so there's a data section. So the dot data section, the usually the dot VSS is what it's called. Um, this is where you have, so the dot data is the initialized variables, the dot VSS is the uninitialized variables, and these are what kind of variables in your C code? Global. Global, yes, they have to be global. Where are local variables stored? Uh, Stack, yes. Awesome. Then we have, so we have the VSS, the data, and then finally at the end, which is usually marked read only, is the dot text segment, which is your actual code. And usually this is around the 008 frame is where that is. So some of this is by standards. So some of this, for instance, like argc and argv, this is actually specified in the POSIX standard because you need to be able to write a main program in C code, and you want to be able to run on any OS that's POSIX compliant. And you need to be able to read in arguments and everything. So that's actually all specified in the standard. The rest of this is probably a mix of maybe some standards, maybe conventions. Right? Do you necessarily need the .vss above the .data? No, you could swap them, right? It doesn't really matter. All right. OK, now we need to get into now that we've understood, okay, this is how the operating system takes these raw bytes and turns them into an actual executing process, we need to actually understand, okay, then what does that mean? What is this process? So what is a process? What does it have? 
Is it just code that's executing? Has an ID. Has an ID that the OS gives it, right? So it has a unique ID for that time frame that it's executing. Yeah. So memory space. Memory space, it has some memory space, what else? And it has its own distinct memory space. That's the other aspect, right? You, the operating system and the hardware, hardware will enforce the fact that you should not be able to modify the memory of another process. Yes? Life cycle. What was that? Life cycle. Life cycle. You want to expand on that a little bit? So the process has definitely a life cycle. Uh, in that life cycle, is, is it executing or not? Right. So the OS has to may only have, I know it sounds archaic, may only have one CPU to actually execute on. So it may have to schedule one process to execute at a time. So it may have to do time sharing and kick some processes off uh, and then uh, take those and then let somebody else execute and then finally come back and start executing the other one. Right? So they may not even be executing all at the same time. What else? What else do, do they have? So when a process tries to access a file, how does the operating system know whether to allow that or not? Was that the file descriptor? So um, a process does have open file descriptors, right? So there's three open by default: standard input zero, standard output one, standard error two. Those are the things you should memorize. Um, it may open new files, and then it'll get a file descriptor that I can read and write from. But how does the OS know to allow it to open a file? Like if I were just, let's say we're all on a shared system and I were to try to write a program that writes to your tilde slash dot SSH slash authorized key file, which if I did that, I could put my public key there and be able to SSH to the server issue. Yeah. The user that started the program? The so there's, per there's not necessarily permissions, it's a tricky thing, especially with Android now, but every process has a user ID and a group ID. And this specifies what permissions does this process have when it's running. So each, and it's actually a little bit more complicated, each process has a real user ID, group ID, an effective user ID, group ID, and a saved user ID and group ID. Um, so the real ID defines the user who started the process. Right? This is why when you're running on, it doesn't, nowadays it doesn't matter most systems, when you run, let's say, your browser, right, that's running as you. You're the user that's running that browser. Right? That means that the browser can do anything that you, the user, could do on the system. Right? Essentially, you're vouching for this process and saying, yes, I'll, I'll allow it to execute on my behalf and do whatever I could do. The effective ID is used to decide what it's actually allowed to do. So this is a kind of a fine distinction. We'll get into it a little bit later. Um, saved IDs allows programs to drop and try to regain privileges. So you may want, let's say, a web server. Um, so we'll talk about it in a bit. But to be to bind to any port on a server less than 1024, you need to be the root user to do that. But do you really want your web server, which is accepting requests from who knows where to be running as root on your system, which as we just saw would mean that now it has, is running with the permissions of root? No, but you do need to run it. It needs to run as root to bind the port. So the server starts up, binds the port, and then drops the privileges. And it actually doesn't use the saved IDs. We'll talk about why later. But uh, it actually makes a call that says, actually, I now want to be executing as on Ubuntu is the www.data user, and that's the user I'll be executing as. Okay, but let's talk about something.
So why is this important? So we're going to stop here, come back, dive into more detail, and say go ahead and use it.